I can't list them all from ACORN, from uh, the BBC, David Kitson, David Allen. I don't know if, Dave, if uh, John Radcliffe is uh, here yet. He was uh, one of the key contributors on the BBC. Paul Bond. Uh, all, all these uh, uh, faces that are so familiar uh, to us, or, or see them all in place again, is absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, let me just uh, <clears throat> Uh, do uh, three quick things. Uh, one is put the BBC Micro in a historic context of the importance that it plays, played in the, in the history of computing as a whole. Then if you bear with me, I, I uh, will tell two anecdotes. Uh, and this is very dangerous in this uh, company because probably lots of people will uh, correct me afterwards. And then uh, if you uh, allow me, I'll just make uh, a couple of remarks on the... Uh, but first, the uh, historic context. Uh, yeah, uh, where we um, uh, started a program uh, to rebuild the ENSAC, uh, which uh, by our definition, of course, is the world's uh, first computer. Uh, as uh, Andy Herbert, who runs the project, uh, uh, said yesterday, uh, it's always the first computer that uh, and it's the first computer that really was used as a, as a computer service. And it's a wonderful project and we got it off to a great start. And this sort of led me uh, to think about uh, the, the five waves of computing, which started with the EdSec and then the mainframe, dominated by IBM. Uh, then came the mini computer, dominated by DEC. Uh, then the workstation, which was finally dominated by Sun. Uh, uh, micro uh, systems. Then came the, the fourth wave, which is the uh, PC wave, and uh, one could argue that the BBC Micro uh, was an early example of the personal computer, although in those days it wasn't actually called personal computing, we called it the, the home computer. Uh, and uh, actually the BBC, the, the forerunner of the BBC Micro were these uh, microprocessor kits that uh, you can still see. But now we're on to the fifth wave, uh, which really is uh, mobile computing. And we're at ARM, uh, which is the microprocessor of choice of mobile computing with a 95% market share. Now if you stand back and look at the properties of waves in general, there's, a, there's one striking um, aspect of this. And that is, there is no single instance where a dominant company of one wave becomes the dominant company of the, main, of the next wave. So IBM, who dominated the mainframe, were uh, succeeded by DEC, who dominated the mini-computer, by Sun, who dominated the workstation, and now by Intel and Microsoft, who dominate the PC business. DEC doesn't exist anymore. Why? I wonder if somebody could switch that off uh, up there if we... Uh, uh, have a few more uh, talks. Uh, why uh, did uh, DEC not make it? Why did uh, DEC disappear? Well, it was not because DEC became an incompetent company. DEC remained the best mini computer uh, producer in the world until the bit rent. The uh, answer was people stopped buying mini computers. And the same thing happened to Sun. Sun didn't become incompetent. Sun remains one of the great companies in this world and certainly the best producer of workstations. And same story, people just stopped buying uh, workstations. So even if you're the best producer of workstations, you don't have an independent existence anymore. And the big question now is, what is going to happen to Intel and Microsoft? Because neither of them really have any significant presence uh, in the mobile world. So are Intel and Microsoft going the same way as DEC, Sun, uh, did in the previous waves? I don't know. I think the, uh, the answer is uh, Intel's microprocessor business uh, is certainly uh, under a lot of uh, pressure from ARM because, uh, as some of you know, ARM is outselling Intel 20 to 1 in the numbers of uh, processors that we produce. Uh, last year it was 8 billion, more than uh, people on Earth. Uh, but more remarkably, I think it was 2010 that the value of the ARM chips that ARM collects royalty on actually overtook Intel sales. 
Uh, and uh, so the, the, the mobile world is, is very different in the number of uh, pieces of uh, kit that it produces, but also the use case, uh, because things become uh, a, a lot easier to use. And here come my, my two anecdotes uh, regarding the BBC Micro. Um, uh, the first one, of course, is how uh, we produced the first one, because uh, David Allen and uh, David, uh, uh, who else was it who? John Cole. John Cole and... And uh, Mill Draper of the DTI. And Mill Draper of the uh, DTI did their rounds of, I think it was six manufacturers, including Sinclair, and they just had an earful from Clive about how uh, we couldn't possibly choose any other uh, processor, uh, any other computer but the Spectrum. And they came to see us with this ridiculous specification that, that John Cole and David had uh, come up with, which was a two-pager, uh, which had everything in the kitchen sink in it. And um, as it happened, uh, Steve had a, a, a computer at home that, did he have a name for that? Was it called the Proton, or did we call it the Proton? Uh, that actually had a very similar uh, ambition, but it didn't exist yet. So, uh, over the weekend, I uh, phoned uh, Sophie and said, uh, Sophie, is there any chance we could have uh, a computer running of roughly to the specification by Friday when the BBC comes back? And he said, absolutely not, there's no way we can do that. So I rang Steve and said, Steve, um, I've just been talking to uh, Sophie and he said, if we really try hard, we might be able to have one by Friday. <laughs> he said, this is nuts, but if Sophie is in, I'm in. So <laughs> we uh, then... Um, managed to get uh, Ram Banerjee, who was the fastest gun in the West uh, at the time, because he could wire wrap, you remember the wire wrap guns, he could wire wrap a board faster than anybody else. And unusually, he never made mistakes. So the, it was about 3,000 wraps or something, had two mistakes, it was absolutely remarkable. And uh, during the night, this was a three day and um, two night effort, or four days and three night effort, and during the night uh, of um, uh, Thursday to Friday, we worked all through the night uh, with the engineers doing what they do uh, best and me making the tea, which uh, is what I do best. And uh, in the morning uh, at eight o'clock, I remember the computer didn't work. And that's when I really turned from a tea lady to the hot shop designer that I have, of course, um, and told them that the the thing to do is to sever the umbilical cord we had between the development system and our prototype board. And that indeed uh, was the clock skew that uh, prevented uh, our prototype board from working. And it sprang into life uh, just before uh, the BBC arrived uh, and they could not believe that this uh, thing would work just after uh, a week, a week after they'd come to us with the uh, specification because I believe you'd been working with uh, Newbury Laboratory for two years on the new brain, and that still didn't work. So that was a, a, you know, a leg up for us and a, an impressive feat. So we, uh, we got the BBC Micro uh, contract, which was for 12,000 units in the first year. I think we finally delivered 100,000 in the first year with all kinds of hiccups uh, that are well documented. And uh, David uh, helped us a lot to prove the quality of our uh, First product and uh, 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 Richard Russell caught the, uh, the uh, definition of the of BBC Micro, but it became a great success. So, looking back, um, what do we think is the greatest legacy of the BBC Micro? And the first knee-jerk reaction would be, well, it's it's off because it's um, a successful uh, company in Cambridge. It's uh, uh, valued at over uh, $10 billion on the stock market, uh, totally the fantastic uh, numbers, and, and of course it is one of, of the great uh, legacies of the BBC Micro Project. But I will put it to you that actually the single greatest legacy of the BBC Micro is that it created uh, a generation of uh, computer scientists and programmers in this country that put Britain at the forefront of um, computer development uh, in the world and computers in schools. Uh, and Mike Lynch is one uh, of the people who readily uh, uh, recognizes that and uh, talks about it uh, whenever he talks about the, the beginning of autonomy 
and, and he confessed to me that he still knows the 65 or two instructions set backwards, uh, because that's what he learned how to program uh, in, uh, as uh, did so many people in Britain. So in many ways, uh, Raspberry Pi is the uh, spiritual successor of the BBC Micro, and I very much hope that it will be as successful as the BBC Micro was in introducing people uh, not to Microsoft Word or Excel, which seems to be our IT curriculum at the moment, but as, uh, again, Steve Ferber in a report uh, for the Royal Society uh, urged uh, the minister to do, to teach people programming. Uh, as every schoolboy did uh, in, uh, during the time that the BBC Micro was the, the standard um, uh, a computer in schools. So here, uh, if you bear with me, here comes my second uh, anecdote, <clears throat> which is about uh, the, the arm. So the reason why uh, we've got this phenomenally successful uh, company here. It has to do with uh, uh, <clears throat> the BBC Micro uh, running out of uh, steam with the 8-bit 6502. And we were uh, looking around for uh, more powerful processors and looked at all the 16-bit and 32-bit processors. In fact, our first uh, choice was the 16032, uh, a national semiconductor microprocessor that we quite liked. Uh, but we looked at the 68,000, uh, and we also looked at the 286. And the 8286 actually was a powerful and, and a reasonable process, and of course Intel was the, the main microprocessor uh, producer at the time, so we went to them and said, the, the 286 is, uh, you know, is a reasonable processor, you just address bus and the uh, data bus coming out of the same pins. But if you gave us the, the core, uh, and we did our own pinout, maybe we can make something of this uh, processor. And they said, get lost. So we said, well, you get lost, we'll do our own. And that's the only reason why the ARM exists, if at the time I think they had uh, worked with us on, on doing our version of the 286, so we would have never bothered doing the ARM. So what were the great advantages that we managed to give uh, to the ARM team that Intel and National and any of the others didn't have? Well, there were two key advantages. One, uh, that, that ACOM managed to give the team, uh, that Intel and National never managed to give their team. So the two advantages were no people. So this was the uh, only microprocessor that was ever designed basically by two people, uh, by uh, Sophie and uh, Stephen, and then backed up uh, by 12 people that uh, finally spun out uh, to, to form on. So it was an incredibly small uh, uh, group of people. And the second big advantage was no money. So there was no way this could be a very complex uh, processor. And we were very lucky at the time that there was a revolution happening in microprocessor design called RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And this was actually an invention that had happened in the United States by Stanford, by people at Stanford and at Berkeley. And uh, it's one of those rare occasions where an American invention was first exploited in Britain. Because normally the story is the other way around. And the first available uh, risk computer in the world was actually the ARM uh, here in Britain. And so the result of that was the world's smallest microprocessor. It had the same number of transistors as a Z80. Uh, which was the most popular microprocessor at the time. I think it was about 30,000 uh, transistors or something. There you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, an interesting side effect of this was that it was very, very low power. It held the world record of MIPS per watt uh, for a very long time. So although it had the same number of transistors as a Z80, it was actually 20 times more powerful. And that's the property that finally made Nokia uh, adopt it. So uh, what happened uh, is that a design aspect, which was not part of, uh, part of the original design spec, we did not uh, set out to produce a low-power microprocessor, uh, but because it was so small, it consumed uh, so little power. That was the reason, finally, why it was adopted by the, uh, by the mobile phone 
companies, and, and, and now it has uh, a 95% market share. So I think these are the two main legacies of, of the BBC Micro. One is that we have a whole generation of uh, software programmers and computer scientists in the UK that learn their trade on the BBC Micro. And the second one is probably R. Thank you very much.